Well, hey, we have uh, two very exciting sessions coming up, uh, current action research and research reports, and uh, I'm going to introduce to you now one of our key researchers, Ana Latiman. Good morning. I have handouts that are being passed out, so if you haven't gotten one, make sure that you get one. I wanted to introduce the people on the panel with me today. Uh, I'll be presenting the charts and the uh, data findings, but I wanted you to know Serena Tiber has been my partner, both in uh, collaborator in coaching as well as in preparing the report and the publication we're working on that comes out of this. I've invited Serena to speak uh, in response to the data from the coaching perspective. I've asked Maria Ro uh, Rocha to speak from the coachee perspective and her personal experience in transforming her classroom and what impact it had on her and her students. And then Rob Williams at the end there will speak from administrator perspective. He was at one of the schools, Fairview Elementary, for the three years that we worked on the teacher quality grant. So I've asked them to listen to uh, the data and they've previewed it and then respond to it from their own personal experience and perspectives. We'll open up the session at the end to questions, comments both from the panel and then questions that you may have to respond to us. We're going to try and end up just right before 11.15 because Jim just took five of my minutes. So, you know, we'll make sure <laughs> that there'll be a quick transition between our presentation and Trish's. So just as a quick overview, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Teacher Quality Recruitment Grant, I'm going to just show you a few slides so you get a big picture overview of what we've been working on. I'll follow that up with uh, quantitative results from one, the year, uh, first year of coaching, and then a trend analysis of year two and three in the coaching outcomes. And then, as I said, we have some qualitative comments that I'll leave for you to read just so we can save some time at the end in there and allow the panel to be the ones who bring to life those qualitative comments. So just to get started, we, uh, in 2005, we were awarded a grant. It was a partnership between Creed, Cal State Stanislaus, and then local school districts. We began with Modesto City Schools and expanded later to Stockton Unified, as well as to Riverbank Language Academy in the Riverbank, it's probably a unified district, right? California, everything has unified. So the overarching goal for the grant was to develop this sort of multi-layered model of teacher education that uh, modeled, taught, and supported the use of effective pedagogy for diverse learners. And we're at Creed, and you know that we have defined that research-based pedagogy as the five standards for effective pedagogy. So we had two innovative strategies. One was that we would work across institutions. We would work at Cal State Stanislaus in teacher education, but within the teacher uh, Cal State Stanislaus, we also worked with the schools of sciences and the liberal arts college there. And then we worked in the public schools uh, with our district partners across time. And in each of those settings, uh, basically from um, we were trying to impact and create a common language and a common pedagogy across those settings so that students in new teacher candidates would see at Cal State Stanislaus their university faculty members using multiple simultaneous and differentiated learning centers and the use of the instructional conversation with their faculty members. They'd have that experience in their own learning, and then when they went out to clinical placements, they would see public school teachers at demonstration sites readied and prepared to model the same sort of pedagogy. So although we have three big goals in the grant, I wanted to be sure just to highlight that we're only today focusing on the second uh, objective, which was the modeling and teaching of the five standards for effective pedagogy. And I'm narrowing the results even a little more, and then I'm not presenting the faculty data tied to the coaching we did with university faculty. I'm only focusing on the clinical placement sites we were working in the preparation of. Okay? So let me give you a brief overview of what our goal in working with public school teachers were. One, we wanted to ready them for new uh, student teachers. And in doing that, we had two ways we worked with them. One, we used the five standards for effective pedagogy as a, a tool, heuristic, a way for them to evaluate tasks that they designed for their learners. 
They could use the five standards and the rubric that we use with that to evaluate the quality of any task. And the second portion of that is to help teachers redesign their classrooms or transform them. As Roland said, and in all of our data in, I've now worked in four sites, that a majority, I haven't found a classroom that isn't working in the common tradition of transmission model, largely whole class dominated. So it's this move that Roland talked about eloquently this morning of uh, moving from uh, the traditional to the half a century or a century and a half use of pedagogy to a new model envisioned uh, with sociocultural theory. That idea that teachers would have access and work with small groups of students on a regular basis to get assistance uh, in their zone of proximal development. So um, this is the biggest challenge is to make that space between the teacher and the student active instead of passive. So that's what we've tried to do. In terms of the instructional model, we have the uh, teacher-led instructional conversation we're trying to get teachers to move toward. And then the uh, use of independent student centers that allow that instructional conversation to take place. In our professional development work at the Teacher Quality Grant, we used a combination of both intensive workshops and then job embedded coaching across a sustained period. In uh, year one uh, of the grant was slightly different than year two and three, and so in the majority of my data, I focused on year two and three and the analysis of coaching data, but I'll present that. Uh, and you'll hear more about our coaching model. Uh, Serena Tyra will be on that panel this afternoon. And basically, we have teachers out of class for an hour uh, with a 30-minute pre pre-conference and a 30-minute post-conference and an observation in between uh, focused on their lesson design that's a joint product between the coach and the teacher. And then the coach uh, captures data, objective data, on how it went throughout the classrooms. So those are the targets that we've had in our coaching. I have included for those, most of you either were involved in the development of, the history of, or the actual uh, rubric. So I won't belabor this too much, but I have included it as the last handout or page in my handout. And this is the rubric that we use with uh, our coaches in the coaching process to help them understand where they are on the rubric and to help them set goals to move from, say, more whole class dominated instruction towards the use of multiple simultaneous differentiated activity center with the instructional conversation as the pivotal focus of their teacher work. We have, the rubric goes from zero to four, and I mention that mostly because one of the things that we're trying to work with teachers to do is get to the integrated level of that rubric. And the only way a teacher can get to that level is if they're using three of the standards simultaneously. So we're never looking for any one of the standards. You can go into any classroom and sustain reading. But what's the, the power or the uh, synergy for learning really happens when you have three of the standards functioning at the same time. When you have more, you're able to score a 20 out of 20 on the rubric. Um, you have that for reference. And I wanted to point out, this isn't in your handout um, because I added it last night, but I wanted to, I'm going to today and tomorrow in my own presentations be talking about the level that we achieved in the coaching process. And so I have just some bands on that rubric for you to maybe sort of understand how we're defining the t from the total score what a, at a 20 points are possible. But if we have a teacher between 7.5 and 12.49, we consider them at the two level or the developing level. And from 12.5 to 17.49 is the enacting level, et cetera. And in integrating is above 17.5. Actually, uh, Celeste Hilberg and Will Doherty were the ones who developed this, these bands and also the instrument. And so uh, we've used, continued to use those strands in um, analyzing our data. So if you'll keep those in mind, I'll show you sort of the progress we made in the data that we've gathered so far. I'm only gonna show two, two or three slides related to year one data. 
We used a quasi-experimental design where we used a control and um, experimental group. We did three rounds of observation by our external evaluators, uh, observations in January, March, and June to look at these two groups' performances. I wanted to note that we had a late start in the first year. We started in January, so we had to cram uh, seven coaching sessions as best we could in a six-month period. So many of the teachers in our uh, first year cohort didn't get to all seven cycles of coaching. And they were also on a year-round schedule, which we found to be quite disruptive to the coaching process and orderliness. You know, So we didn't have a lockstep that in March we could guarantee that everybody was on coaching session three or four. So some had their break there and they would be picking up in the third session of that. So I think that's important just to note uh, in the first year. You'll see there on your handout that um, there were significant differences in the uh, control group and the experimental group, uh, ultimately, at the, ultimately at the end, but also in the beginning. Uh, I said we had a, a late start to the first year. So our teachers, our 24 teachers in the first cohort in the experimental group had already attended five days of workshop, two days in October, two in December, and one in January. So the first evaluations were done right after they finished the fifth day of professional development in that week or so after. So one thing we see from the outset is that the workshop created, say, a four-point difference in terms of teachers' performance. If we didn't have job-embedded coaching to follow, I think we would only see that level of change between the control group and the experimental group. So as you see, we ultimately ended up with about a eight-point spread between the control group and the experimental group. But in that six-month period where there was sort of uneven coaching, the highest level, say, in the total score mean was 13.77. And that takes us on that scale just to the enacting level. Remember, integrating is the highest level. So we fell short in terms of that. So I've mentioned these conclusions. You can read them there. But we see the workshop made a difference from the outset. We also see that teachers generally improved in their use of the standards across the, the coaching, but the level of performance only got to a 13.77 average, and there was quite a wide standard deviation there, you can see, across the, the groups. So we actually ended our first year of coaching with questions. You know, um, why didn't or how can we ensure higher level of implementation of those five standards at the end of a coaching period? We want people to be at the integrating level, not the enacting level of those five standards. Because if they're at the enacting level, that shows us they're not using three of the standards simultaneously to get that improvement in learning. We also wanted to know if more coaching sessions led to more learning and how we could tell how far people got at three coaching sessions. What's the value of three versus four, five, or seven? Or do we need more than that to have a real impact on teacher change? And we also wanted to understand, and that's why I chose to analyze year two and three coaching data, which of the standards seemed to have the quick start? Which ones were the easier for ones for teachers to understand to get a hold of, and which seemed to linger longer and take longer to develop? And so that's the data I'm trying to show you today. Uh, basically, I've done a trend analysis, and I'll try to address those three questions I just put up for you from year one. So what's the pattern of development that exists uh, across coaching with teachers and the five standards? Overall, first you're going to see that we have a general incline of improvement over time. This represents seven coaching cycles. You can see that cycle one through five showed steady improvement. We have a strange little dip at uh, um, coaching cycle six, and then improvement again in cycle seven. This is, um, I pretty much know where this came from, so I'll give you my best guess, although um, from looking at the data and the dates and when coaching happened, this dip happened to be during the standardized testing periods in the districts. Okay, good. I don't need to say more, do I? Okay, and we'll show when I show you the five standards, the impact on instruction, what happens when teachers are teaching for the test rather than teaching for learning. And we'll see that in a minute. 
So we had a general trend up. Uh, in this, we happened to have a linear pattern and a quadratic pattern. When we look at change scores, you see the most change, the biggest impact for change is between coaching sessions one and two, you see the most direct change or impact. A little bit less in the third coaching session, another gain in the fourth, and a little less. Let me show it to you, uh, of course, the decline there. This is another chart. I think you can see it, I hope, well enough on the bottom. It shows those same details. There's the change score mapped against the total score. So when you see, when you begin a coaching process, you have big leaps in the first two, three sessions, then a steady, albeit smaller, progress that takes time and goes across time. Okay, so which of the standards are harder or more easy for the teachers to implement? The coaching data, thank goodness, gives us a pretty good clear picture of what that is. Um, again, I'll point out the dip, but I'll show you how that shows up in the data in a bit. But again, for all the standards, it was pretty much a linear uh, pattern, except for with contextualization. So from cycle one to two, what you see is the first change in coaching when we work, start to work with teachers is a change from individual products, having every student in the class do their own product, to a collaborative product. So you see a big jump in joint productive activity. We see some growth in contextualization, cognitive challenge, and language and literacy development. And you see that there's not movement in the instructional conversation during those fir that first coaching cycle, nor would we expect it to be, right? Because that could be chaos. We've had some people try to jump to that, and uh, the logistics don't support such a big change. From coaching cycle two to three, you begin to see, by the third coaching session, teachers wanting to move and get the instructional conversation in place. They feel pretty much that they have simultaneous centers going. Students move when they're supposed to move, do what they're supposed to do. And now they feel safe enough to sit down and work with a small group of students while other students are engaged in independent activity. We see less change there at this cycle is needed in joint productive activity because they already conquered that in the earlier sessions from one to two. When we move to cycle three and four, this is, so it's only in the third to the fourth cycle that we see teachers really beginning to focus on the instructional conversation. That takes the bulk of their energy, but you also see, let's say, concurrent improvement and change in joint productive activity, because those of us who use this scale regularly know that on the highest level of joint productive activity, the teacher is working with a small group of students on a product together. So you see changes both in JPA, language and literacy development, and cognitive challenge that accompany that growth in um, the use of the instructional conversation. This is going to become a pattern, what I mentioned next, is that contextualization lags behind in the, in the coaching process. Their ability to contextualize for their learners and bring in the home, school, or community experience is something the teachers we saw in the teacher quality grant struggle to do effectively. They could make great incidental connections, but perhaps unlike other communities, like in the KEEP project when you were speaking this morning, when you're embedded and the minority is the majority, it's uh, perhaps easier to do for the teachers. But we see this slower move towards contextualization. Then in cycles uh, four and five, the push continues to be on quality instructional conversations and increasing the quality of contextualization in the lessons. We have our strange dip. Uh, the state testing dip. But I wanted to point out, notice what gets dropped first when you're teaching for the test. Student language use and contextualization. So you can imagine um, this is the telling that returns. There still may be cognitive challenge, but they're most likely uh, not using much language and they're filling in more worksheets than usual or bubbles. And finally, in um, cycle six to seven, uh, the only, in this context, the only standard that remained in decline that didn't recover from the state testing bounce was contextualization. 
it was uh, a little bit gratifying to see the numbers that supported uh, the coaching experience that I, Serena, and Christy Ravellis have had and had talked as we were going through the process that teachers weren't really grasping contextualization the way we had hoped. And uh, we continue to work on that in our coaching model. So uh, here are the teacher trends in development. I, um, in cycle one, you'll see that teachers rank highest on language and literacy development. I think that's the standard they're most prepared to work with. They're already doing this, they expect to do it in their language blocks, and they're, they score the highest on that. Cycle two then is this focus on joint productive activity, changing from individual assignments to collaborative assignments. In cycles three to four, we see teachers beginning to bring in the, the readiness for the instructional conversation, but it is in the lowest level of implementation. It's not at the highest level where student talk exceeds teacher talk and that teacher is asking for rationales. You just see that they're now seated together having an academic conversation, but the lotus or the um, bulk of talk has not switched to the students making sense and constructing meaning with the assistance of the teacher. Uh, in session four and five, and you can see from three, four to the seven, instructional conversation remains an ongoing uh, concern and interest. And even in cycle seven, the IC and contextualization are the ones still in need of support by the end of the seven coaching cycles. So I think I, I probably said the next side in, in many ways. JPA is the easiest. Teachers are most ready for cognitive challenge and language and literacy development. That makes sense. That's what teaching is supposed to be cognitively challenging, so hopefully, and uh, as well as supporting language and literacy development. The instructional conversation requires multiple coaching sessions. First, just to get them to the move, to work and be, feel safe enough instructionally to sit down and work with a small group of students. And then the quality of that conversation to increase takes more than uh, two, safely more than two. I would suggest four, at least, or more coaching sit sessions focused on that. And the IC and the contextualization are the hardest ones to improve. So if I go to the last question and saying, well, what about ultimate achievement? We really don't want, we want teachers at the integrating level. What does it look like across time in terms of that? Um, in your handout, you have the same slide and it'll show you per per standard where someone is. And remember on this slide, it's a four point scale. Each of the standards are four points possible times five standards to get a 20 point scale. You can see the loading of those individually. So again, quick gains cycle one through three, but gradual, slow, steady improvement from four to seven. Now here is where I um, include those bands of development, again, or on the rubric, what we would count as developing, enacting, or integrating levels. And you see that at the end of coach, uh, coaching cycle seven, we had an average of 15.45, uh, which brings the teachers into the enacting, but not out of those basically 24, 25 teachers we coached each year. We could get many of them to integrating, but not all of them. There were still a steady, steady set of teachers who, despite the coaching and maybe even consciously, they understood that they were making choices not to go as far as the five standards would want them to, either for personal reasons, for feeling scripted by districts and pacing guides. There could be a, a, a number of reasons and we're doing some follow-up research to look at those patterns of resistance in uh, other contexts now. So in terms of the feedback and summing up the data, I do see evidence, clear evidence, that job embedded coaching leads to statistically significant changes between control and experimental groups. The coaching product and um, process is working. We want to continue thinking about how we can leverage development of the instructional conversation and contextualization. Uh, 
Goldenberg has written quite a bit in Saunders on this topic and the difficulty of uh, whether teachers who can do ICs are born or made. And we're in the process of making that happen. And so we want to do some more focus and working on what are the challenges that hinder there. And we want to improve our process, especially in terms of contextualization. And tomorrow I'll share some things that I've begun to do in Indianapolis in our coaching process that have statistically changed our outcomes there. So uh, the focus group data, the quotes from teachers are in the handout. And I don't think you need me to read them to you. So I'm going to leave that because I just wanted to point out that there are four themes. And I think our panel can speak to those uh, with more dynacism than any words on paper, but the words on paper are there for you as well. In all our focus group uh, in uh, 2006, 7, and 8, the overarching number one positive aspect in the minds of teachers is the individualized external coach uh, providing support throughout a school year. They value that. They value the work with their coaches. They also talk about the impact on the school, about how now, how they're planning together, helping each other how they pair new teachers who come into the school with someone who's already done that. They speak uh, eloquently about their own professional growth as well as student response to that. So uh, in just skipping those slides and leaving that to you to read as I get to where we open it up to you and to our panel. I've asked the panel to begin. I'm going to begin with Maria Roche with her speaking first and then uh, Rob Williams will respond and then Serena and after they're done we can ask them questions they've been the main participators in the process or uh, any way you'd like to function after that um, again again my name is Maria Rocha um, I had the pleasure of having Serena as my coach uh, my school joined or became a creed school in the third year of the grant um, I come from the Riverbank Language Academy in Riverbank um, I benefited so much from being coached by Serena, from being our school, from participating in, in the CREED project. Um, I went from a scripted program where it told me exactly what to do. My kids, were, my kids were working out of workbooks. I was fighting it tremendously, but unfortunately, um, I didn't have a supportive administrator. Um, whole different story. We became charter school. We, our administrator um, got in contact with um, Stan State, and that's how we joined the CREED um, project. Um, I have seen so much growth in my students since I started um, implementing CREED centers in my classroom. Uh, my kids are no longer afraid when I ask them why. Tell me why you think that, or tell me more about that. Um, they will ask questions, and they're really meaningful questions, like their level of questioning has also greatly improved in my classroom. Um, I teach third grade, um, and my kids have become their own problem solvers because when I'm doing my instructional, when I'm having my instructional conversation, it's like they know that that's very important time for me and my small group, so they have to figure out things on their own. It's no longer teacher take care of us or take care of this problem. It's you guys deal with it. The teacher is busy doing something else. Um, I mean, I can't well, say enough. But Maria, about Maria also needs to, oh, this whole mic thing. <laughs> Maria also needs to mention am I, that she is a dual language school and her children are doing these instructional conversation in Spanish and they are English speakers. 30% are English speakers, 30% are Spanish speakers, and then 30% of the classroom are true bilinguals. So they're doing these instructional conversations in both languages yes. a, a, to a very effective degree. Yes, um, and I think that's where the, um, you having or requiring or expecting my kids to use the, you know, the language is real, has also really helped them develop not only their Spanish skills, but also their English skills. Because they have to, in order for them to complete their assignments, they have to be talking to each other, using academic language in either Spanish or English for that, so that they can you know, achieve the, the goal that my task card has set for them. So um, yes, I mean, I loved having Serena come into my classroom and tell me what was working and tell me what I needed to improve on. I mean, it's, 
it's something that I looked forward to. It's like, okay, Serena's gonna come <laughs> and observe me and you know, help me move forward. I think it really helped me as a teacher move forward. Um, I've, all, I've been teaching for almost 13 years and this is the first time that I actually had someone coming on a regular basis to help me improve my teaching and to help me become a better teacher, so. It's my turn, huh? <laughs> I think that might help you to, if I give you a little context about myself and my, my school, that where I worked, Wind Creed was part of my school culture. Um, I'm one of John Goodlad's scholars. So John Goodlad has 30 scholars across the United States that are really looking at how to do school differently. So when Creed came about, I'd, I'd already knew that having a partnership with the university made sense and, and that the pedagogy, a nurturing pedagogy, go to, go to, made sense. Um, I was also affiliated with a group in Washington, which is now Linda Darlingham and, and John Goodlad's think tank. So the idea of having a school, having a broader purpose, and, I mean, it, it made sense to me when Creed came about, so that's the context. Um, I'm in a district that uses clipboards and comes through classrooms to say that 80% of your teachers are, using the, are clearly communicating the standard or posting their standards. So my district is very, very uh, rigid, very traditional. So to have Creed come in was, was something uh, that really helped me I mean, uh, in a district that I knew it didn't make sense to just simply say, um, in order to get good pedagogy, you tell people, um, here's what you have to do. Now just do it. So for me, Creed was a wonderful opportunity to change the, the school culture. Um, I had at each year, uh, at the most 15 student teachers on campus and my master teachers um, knew the language that the student teachers were using. So for me, the boom years, boom years of, of my leadership um, were the years with Creed. I moved from that site to a new site and I started the year off this year with seven student teachers and it was a bomb. I mean, it was just a terrible experience. I did not have the structure of the university's partnership. I did not have Creed. So for me, Creed really helped create a school where everybody was learning. The master teachers, the student teachers, conversations were going on between me and the university. So it was a wonderful experience and I'd be happy to answer any other questions. But for me, it was the boom years and I'm from the California foothills, so it was the nugget time. <laughs> Well, I had the opportunity to participate in the Nugget time as well. I was the, a coach on at all these sites over the three years. And what we saw with these teachers is just like Anala said, a huge growth. We took teachers where they were and were able to help them move through understanding the standards. We gave them a common language, a common pedagogy, a common understanding of what classrooms should look like. Most of our teachers when we started had the cemetery model. Children were staring, <laughs> teachers were talking. And by the end, we had engagement. And it's because of teachers like Maria and principals like Rob that we saw that going on in the classroom. So should we turn it over to them? Sure. So I, I think Jim wanted people to step to the mic in the middle. Or do something. In, can do something Thanks for that presentation. I have a couple questions for the panel, I guess. One, um, I'm a bit of a data guru. So um, I was looking at, at the groups and I noticed, as you, you pointed out, there was a significant difference starting. Now it does get larger, they part. I guess one question I'd like you to consider is, is there some sort of base level that teachers need to be at to grow? I mean, so in other words, um, the teachers then who started off higher, were they in a place that allowed them to benefit from the coaching? Um, and the second question is that in a lot of our school reforms, the big concern is the lack of connection between the change in pedagogy and the change in academic achievement that's manifested by the way we measure it in test scores and so forth. And uh, are, do the data match up? Thank you. I, I think at Fairview, uh, Will Doherty showed, and I was able to show my directors and the superintendent that over the three years, there was significant growth in English language performance. And this is a 800 students are Latino who speak Spanish as their primary language. But yes, we were, Will showed statistically in English language arts there was movement in the Creed classrooms. And it only makes sense. There was more student to student engagement. 
kids got to practice what they were learning, so it wasn't a surprise. So statistically, Will showed it at, at my school. I think one thing, the, the comment you made about is there a starting point where teachers can benefit, um, we, it, there was an attitudinal or a disposition between teachers who volunteered the first year and teachers, for example, at Pittman Elementary in Stockton that the whole school was going creed, so they had to follow along. So I think there, there is something to that and some, um, we haven't done the statistical analysis in looking at those patterns. I wanted to add one bit of context in the teacher quality grant. I would could honestly say one mistake that we made in design is that we went into Modesto District and went to multiple schools. We worked in as many as 10 different schools. And that's one of the first modifications I made in going to Indianapolis is I've picked three demonstration schools and I'm doing whole school change because uh, it's very different when one or two teachers in a building are trying to change and everybody, they don't have the supports system, so I think that's part of the formula of success. Also, one of the reasons we haven't done student achievement data in, um, I, Jim Burns and uh, Rob and I have talked about an easy way to do that now, looking at Fairview, where we were for three years, um, but we haven't had time to get to that. But one of the reasons we uh, didn't is that many of the, in the, the evaluator was going randomly to control group teachers and we were coaching in a particular language arts block or science or math, but the controls all didn't match that. And that's something else I've chosen to change in Indianapolis. I have coached only in the language arts and I observe everyone in the language arts. So the control measures are equal or very different because you can have a teacher who teaches one way in language arts and is very different in mathematics, depending on their, or science, in their comfort zone of where, what they feel most comfortable with. And so I feel that it was a little bit, we couldn't really just go to the language arts data to show change because they weren't equivalent observations. And we need teachers to be all viewed with the same instrument in the same content area for design. I have a couple of questions too. Um, this one for the principal, Rob, yep. and for Maria, the, the teacher. One of the issues in terms of making um, a change for learners is sustainability. And um, one of the, the questions I've always had to grapple with in my head was, how do you build capacity and sustain an effort? And actually, you gave two perfect kind of scenarios. One is of a principal who's come from a school that embraced it wholeheartedly and now is moving to another location mm. with no infrastructure in place. And I'd like for you to talk about um, your ideas about how, are, well, if you have them, uh, no, I, how do you go about I'm jumping, I'm jumping at the bit. I mean, I'm, I'm sure ready. sure he has them. Well, and for Maria, <laughs> yeah. the grant is coming to a close. So the day-to-day -day coaching that, or the regular coaching that you've been experiencing will be dwindling. And I know that CSU Stanislaus is building capacity in terms of working with the schools, but as a teacher who has experienced this over a few years and now has seen changes in her students, what, from your perspective, can a teacher do or what will you do to help sustain the effort? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, and I'll try to make it brief, but I'm finishing my first year at a very, very difficult assignment. I mean, I it took me five months to feel comfortable at this new school. Um, and you can imagine everything you think worse about a school, this is the site. <laughs> but I, yesterday we were planning the next step for staff, staff's growth and commitment to one another. And um, there's a book coming out in December of this year called Five Degrees of Freedom by Sam Shaltain in Washington, D.C. He works with Linda Darling Hammond, Five Degrees of Freedom. And it's about Answering the question, how do, you how do you build sustainability? It begins with, with the teachers in, in, involved. I believe that we are poised to have people create a system in place of looking at data and talking about best practices and pushing each other. So I believe that I'm giving them an opportunity in June and July, because we start July 8th, this is your school, and I may be gone three years from now, and what's going to be left is your commitment to each other on, on looking at data, 
measuring progress academically and socially, and I'll stress that socially because our meeting's not just about academics. It's about whether or not, oh, we're gonna use the national standards for school climate, that's another group, but this is their school, and I'm there to help facilitate them to get at what you're asking at. I'm only looking at three or four more years at this assignment, and I wanna leave with some confidence that they own, this is our results, and we have to keep looking at best practices, which Creed is, I hope, will be at the core of what they're doing. And I think what he just said is really, I think, very unique about my school is that our principal wholeheartedly believes in best practices. Um, he, we are hiring a lot. We have a lot of new teachers joining our, our staff every year. Uh, most of them are former student teachers that have also been trained in Creed. Um, and I think as a staff, we've embraced Creed. We believe in it. I mean, we honestly know that this is the how to best teach our students. Um, again, I'm, com I'm coming from a dual language immersion experience, and we want our kids not only to be proficient in English, but we want them to be proficient in Spanish, and hopefully very soon in a third language. So, you know, as the staff, we've embraced Creed. Everybody, almost everybody, <laughs> Serena knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> almost everybody at our school is doing Creed Centers. New teachers um, do work with the veteran teacher, and so we, we have that planning together where um, you are pretty much spreading it. You're spreading Creed, and you're keeping it alive. And I think because we do believe in it, I think it's gonna be, it's part of our culture, it's part of our school. It has become part of our school culture, where, I mean, if you're not doing Creed, you, there must be something wrong with you. <laughs> I wanted to um, add that the people who are here aren't by accident. The schools we've been most successful at have been Fairview, where the principal was a, a leader in the school and bought into and participated in the workshops that we did. The same th thing happened at uh, Pittman Elementary. The principal showed up every all five days and was part of the system of change at the school that made a difference. And another key factor is Cal State Stanislaus faculty were deeply involved in these sites with us. And so the university public school partnership, not just the external part of Creed. We're at 2.16 on, oh, oh That's Eastern time. time, sorry. <laughs> but it's 16 after, and they're supposed to start at 15 after. So should we end here and so we can stay on time and then come back if people will keep their questions for um, networking times? Thank you very much. That's us.